Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, China needs more coal to power its homes and industry as it faces its first blackouts in a decade. As the world attempts to reduce its reliance on coal, will the banks be the big winners? Also this week, when is a digital currency not an e-currency? Venezuela launches the digital Bolivar in another attempt to revive its worthless currency. Back to the 1970s, as energy prices soar, inflation rises and the economy slows, is stagflation about to make an unwelcome return? China is in the grip of a power crunch, a shortage of coal, new tougher emission standards and rising demand from industry have all contributed to push coal prices to record highs. That's triggered power blackouts in some parts of the country. And India has warned it only has enough coal for four days. More than half of India's power plants are on alert for outages after surging electricity demand. Despite calls to slow global warming, our dependence on coal is only increasing, especially in China and Asia. Today, it accounts for almost 40% of all electricity generation. Billions of dollars are still being committed to new projects. That may be about to all change. There is an initiative that could be unveiled at the COP26 climate conference meeting in Glasgow next month. The Asian Development Bank and UK insurer Prudential are working on plans to buy coal power plants in Asia and shut them down long before they come to the end of their lives. China's President Xi Jinping pledged to end funding coal projects overseas. That could affect 54 megawatts of planned projects, which could save the world three months of global emissions. But details are scarce, and this only applies to overseas investments. China has been the biggest funder of coal plants, investing $45 billion since 2014. Japan is the second biggest with $20 billion. Now, we mention that because it's the biggest shareholder of the Asian Development Bank, along with the United States. The ADB has financed $42.5 billion of all types of power projects since 2009. Its new plan to buy coal plants is likely to cost around $120 billion, which in the big scheme of things isn't much. Rich nations were supposed to be contributing $100 billion a year to poor countries to mitigate the impact of climate change. Right now, China has set aside its new emissions market and told local authorities to find the coal to power electricity generation. Rob McBride explains. The provinces in China's northeast are suffering some of the country's worst power cuts, with cities plunged into darkness lasting hours. It was completely dark. I can see nothing, because the power is cut from everything. Only when vehicles drove past could you see lights on. Around two-thirds of provinces are now affected. It's due in part to the rising cost of coal, which means it's harder for power plants to make a profit, so they're producing less electricity. That's affecting economic output, with some analysts predicting a slower growth rate this year. China's older, more energy-hungry industries are being hurt the hardest, but the country's leadership is on a drive to transform to a greener, more energy-efficient society. And for that, it needs to move away from its reliance on coal. Gradually, air pollution has been reducing in China's major cities. And even China's neighbours, like South Korea, have been seeing more blue skies. But President Xi Jinping, as he outlined to the recent UN General Assembly, wants China to become carbon neutral by 2060. He's set ambitious targets for provincial governments to reduce carbon emissions, adding to the pressure to cut back on burning coal. And now, with this really tightened environmental regulation uh, in the background of carbon emission reduction, uh, there is a strong incentive for local governments to shut down power plants and also curb uh, the coal production. And that's why we get here. Trying to strike the balance between environmental ambitions and economic growth, with the energy demands of the winter months just ahead. Rob McBride, Al Jazeera, Hong Kong. 
Right, let's get some analysis now on our dependence on coal and the initiative from the Asian Development Bank. Joining us from Paris via Skype is Lucy Pinson, Executive Director at Reclaim Finance. Good to have you with us. So what do you make of the Asian Development Bank's plans to buy up coal-fired power plants across Asia? So we believe there is an emergency to phase out from the coal sector. We have uh, very little time. According to climate science, most of the coal plants and coal mines needs to be shut down by 2030. And all of them needs to be shut down by 2040. So obviously, it's a massive challenge. There are thousands of coal infrastructures around the world, including thousands in, in Asia, and the challenge is huge because we need to plan for the conversion of, of the workers, but also the development of a, of a cleaner alternative renewable energy in particular. And we believe uh, a public uh, scheme could be interesting in order to facilitate this uh, phase out. However, we need to pay very much attention to the details. Um, will it, are we going to just buy out uh, from companies uh, polluting infrastructure um, without putting condition. If it's what the Asian Development Bank has in mind, it's not going to work. All right. So given what you said, do you think that this plan of purchasing coal power plants is going to actually help countries move towards meeting that green transition initiative you're talking about or challenge? It could, um, again, at the conditions that uh, the buyout is uh, um, only for companies that commit to stop building new coal plants and that will commit also to close uh, their coal plants in order to develop uh, renewable energies. And unfortunately, we see that there is a big temptation for companies to go from the coal sector to the gas sectors. And unfortunately, we know gas is a fossil fuel that needs to remain in the ground. And that gas is um, pollutes a lot through the methane emissions that are actually increasing uh, in the past year. And it's uh, the IPCC report that has been published this uh, summer clearly show that if we don't manage our the emissions of methane, we are not going to make it uh, and be able to limit global warming at 1.5. So the two conditions really need to be made. Companies need to be um, forced to stop expanding and building new coal plants, but they also need to commit to build renewable energy and not move but, from uh, Lucy, what I'm gas. asking is, what is the likelihood of those two conditions being met? What do you think is going to happen? The conditions will be made if um, the infrastructure, the scheme to buy out this plant, mm -hmm. put these two conditions on the table. Um, it's not happening yet, so it's up to the Asian development banks to only buy uh, coal plants from uh, companies that will uh, commit to, to do these two conditions. Okay. Now, I want to share this, and I'm sure you know these numbers, but in January 2021, 4,488 institutional investors, which of course includes pension funds, banks, sovereign wealth funds, and so on, well, they all held investments totaling $1.03 trillion in companies operating along the thermal coal value chain, right? The world's largest institutional investor in the coal industry is, of course, the U.S. mutual fund company Vanguard. We keep that in mind. U.S. investors collectively account for 58% of institutional investments in the global coal industry. Now, with holdings of $81 billion, investors from Japan account for the second highest share of institutional investments in the coal industry. So if you keep all of this in mind, and keep in mind as well that the biggest shareholders of the ADP are the U.S. and Japan, does this start to look like the US and Japan is using the ADB to cover their institutional investors, well, I guess you could say bad investments? For sure, that is very urgent that both uh, this institution takes of responsibility and actually commit to stop uh, financing the development of coal plants uh, abroad. We have also seen in, in, the, uh, the, in the last week uh, China, which has made a big commitment to stop uh, developing new coal plants abroad, 
um, a waiver. We are also waiting for China to take the same commitment at home and to make sure that its commitment does apply to plans and projects that are already in the pipeline. So for sure, we can see a lot of inconsistencies from different uh, countries when it comes to closing and exiting from the coal sector in order to uh, meet the climate pledges. Now, what about all the talk from financial institutions about their zero, net zero goals? Is that just rhetoric when you keep in mind that they're still providing finance to coal, right? They are still providing finance to coal, and unfortunately, we we can see that there is a big discrepancy between the net zero pledges taken by private financial institutions. Uh, you mentioned Vanguard, but we could also mention BlackRock, which is the second biggest investor in the coal power sector and which has a very minimal uh, coal policy, which is covering only 17 percent of the of the coal industry and which is applied to less than a third of its assets under management. And According to the coal policy tool, which is a tool um, available online, which analyzes uh, policies that have been adopted by hundreds of financial institutions uh, on the coal sector, we can see that hundreds of financial institutions don't have any coal policy, and that if we can uh, today uh, identify more than 260 financial institutions with a coal policy, only 25 of these policies are actually robust enough in order to prevent the expansion of the coal sector and uh, support its phase out. And we, we can see the inconsistency is huge um, in, from many financial institutions, but including from the UK banks which are under the spotlight uh, because of uh, COP26, which is coming. And unfortunately, we can see that none of the UK banks, Barclays, HSBC, or Standard Charter, has actually adopted a robust coal exit policy. Actually, they have provided 56 billion of dollar financing to companies that are listed on the global coal exit list between October 2018 and October 2020. So it's very urgent for all these private financial institutions, starting with the biggest asset managers, you mentioned BlackRock, Vanguard, I mentioned BlackRock, and the UK banks, to respond to the climate emergency and actually do what it takes to meet uh, the net zero pledge. All right, thanks so much for making that point. Lucy Pinson there. Thank you. Venezuela introduced a new currency, the digital Bolivar, with six fewer zeros than the previous one. The move makes the currency more manageable after years of hyperinflation. More than 50 countries have been down this redenomination road since World War II. The most significant redenomination in history occurred in Hungary in 1946, when the pengo was changed to the forint with an exchange rate of 400 octillion to one. Now, if you're trying to think, what is an octillion? Well, it's a one followed by 27 zeros. More recently, Zimbabwe redenominated its currency three times between 2006 and 2009. With inflation hitting nearly 80 billion percent, the country cut 12 zeros off the value of the Zimbabwe dollar. And one more example, chronic inflation in Turkey between 1970 and 2005 resulted in the depreciation of the lira. Similarly, Venezuela's year-on-year -year inflation is 1,743%, according to the Venezuelan Finance Observatory. But the new digital currency may be misleading because, according to the Financial Times, the digital currency is no different to any other currency. The confusion was enough to spark a cryptocurrency rally. According to Chainalysis, Venezuela has the seventh highest take-up of cryptocurrencies and is not being used for speculation, but for remittances in everyday use. Vietnam has the highest level of crypto adoption. Many countries are thinking about rolling out digital currencies, but the Caribbean is leading the world with the deployment of digital currencies. The Bahamas has the sand dollar, and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank launched Dcash. 
All right, let's bring in our guest now, Kimberly Grauer, Director of Research at Chainalysis Inc. Good to have you with us. So, Kimberly, there are 14 countries which are currently piloting central bank digital currencies, including China. But why have Caribbean nations been the first to actually launch theirs? We are seeing that central bank digital currencies are seeing increased interest throughout the world. And I think that's because there's a lot of benefits that they can pose, that they can offer. They cut down on fraud and corruption, and they can reduce theft, and especially in places that rely heavily on cash. And there's also opportunities where they can kind of make banking a little bit easier across the board for this unbanked population. And when it comes to the Caribbean, we can only really speculate as to why there being such leaders in this space. I know we recently just finished a report that looked at cryptocurrency adoption at every country. And actually, the Caribbean didn't stand out in any real regard in that, in general, cryptocurrency adoption compared to other regions. The, the, the most adoption actually happened in the Dominican Republic, which ranked 51st on our global cryptocurrency adoption index. So we don't, it's probably not related to cryptocurrency adoption, but I do think from what I've heard that there is a strong desire to modernize the payment infrastructure throughout the Caribbean in order to effectively transact with people on these, um, people on different islands. And um, especially since most of the country, a lot of the countries, there's a lot of different disconnected islands and they already are already relying on cash, that it can make things just more logistically difficult. And so I think that it's seen as an opportunity to kind of overcome some of those problems. Well, cool. Now that we're talking about the data, Venezuela launched the Petro. That seems to have sank, though. Any data on the uptake there? The data that we've seen on um, when it comes to the Petro app is we've actually seen the number of people visiting the site steadily declining. And so it's, it's the main number that we're looking at right now, whereas there was a peak of 7 million users in, um, when, after launch in 2019. Now we're looking at around a couple, 100,000 or so average monthly people going to visit you know, the Petro app site. So, and this is kind of steady, continuing to steadily decline over the past um, 12 months. So I think that your, um, what you propose at the question is, is probably somewhat true. Should we be a little bit surprised to see Vietnam, India at the top of the adopters of crypto? You know, many people around the world would associate those countries with good, strong economic growth. Why are people going digital there with their money? I think that there's um, not one story to tell. One of the things that we've learned from the cryptocurrency report is that every country has a different set of so social, political, um, economic reasons that are underpinning this adoption. And so India and Vietnam are actually very different stories. We saw in India, there was a lot of DeFi activity and a large, um, and a lot of the transfers were extremely large. Um, and then when we went in to talk to people about this data, we heard a lot about home office investments, um, high net worth individuals, um, really taking part in um, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And then when you go to Vietnam, we're seeing more peer-to-peer -peer market activity. We're seeing, and we know about a, a strong remittance hub in, in Vietnam. So we, we think that, um, we think that growth has actually been consistent for them throughout the year and relative to all of their social circumstances, they're doing well, but they're actually thriving for different reasons. What impact do you think, though, China's ban might have on cryptocurrencies? Have you been a little bit surprised to see them so far? Well, I guess you could say the tokens are taking them in their stride so far. Bans are nothing new, especially in China. And um, previous bans have been somewhat sporadically enforced, resulting in the effects on Bitcoin to be somewhat short-lived, as we've probably seen um, in the past few weeks. And just to note, though, I think countries around the world are taking up these discussions on how they want to interact with digital currencies and what's interesting and how they want to go about doing this. So I think people will be looking to some of these major events to see the impact more generally. All right. Thanks so much. It's been good talking to you. Thank you. Oil, gas, coal and food prices are soaring, adding to rising inflation. 
Supply chain disruption is leading to factory closures, which is impacting economic growth. Together, rising inflation and slowing growth or stagflation spells trouble. It's reawakening fears which last surfaced in the 1970s when an oil price shock decimated growth. Then, inflation and interest rates ran into double digits, unemployment soared, and economic growth struggled for traction. The global economy is facing other headwinds, including a warning from the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. The world's biggest economy would fall into recession if Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling that would roil the $22 trillion U.S. government debt market should the government default on its debt. And in China, once China's biggest property developer Evergrande is wrestling with more than $300 billion in liabilities. Evergrande's possible collapse has triggered worries about contagion risks to the property sector in the world's second largest economy. Let's get some analysis now from Naeem Aslam. He's the chief markets analyst at Avatrade, joins us now live from London. So should we be concerned about stagflation, Naeem, or is this just a storm in a teacup? So thanks for having me. Look, I think with respect to inflation, uh, central banks have made their position very clear that this is nothing but just a transitory factor. And they believe that inflation will fall at perhaps at a Q1 of 2022. But if we look at the overall supply um, supply chain and the pressure coming from the prices because of the bottleneck, which is created because of the constraint on the supply chain, that is a concern. And we believe the central banks should react and then don't really think this is only a transitory issue because this could actually hurt the economy if it continues to rise at a pace that we have seen in the past few quarters or in the past few months. So you don't entirely agree with the central banks when they say, hey, inflation is just temporary? <laughs> no, well, for the time being, yes. But I think given where we are for the uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of the economic data, I think there is a qualm among investors that, yes, inflation should start coming down now if it doesn't then there is a serious problem for the global economy. And you mentioned there the uh, supply chain bottlenecks, one of the world's biggest global port operators, Dubai's DP World, warning about that. Um, does this suggest to you factories might slow or even stop production, not only because of uh, energy shortages, but just to meet lower consumer demand? I, I think that the key element over here is energy shortage, which is very much slowing down the production. And of course, coronavirus has disturbed the entire supply chain, and that will take time. But we don't necessarily think that it is going to take two years for that production to come back to the pre-coronavirus level. We believe that by the end of Q2 in 2022, we should see fairly very good reaction on the supply chain and then these constraints should start mitigating by that period. Mm. Let's talk about another self-inflicted crisis, the US debt ceiling, which could have a huge impact not only on the 22 trillion US government debt market, but also on jobs. Do you think it's time the US got rid of the law limiting borrowing? It's a drama that we have seen many times previously. If you look at the history, 88 times the US has increased its debt ceiling. And every time it is the last minute. If the US defaults, that's a massive issue for the US economy, for its rating, for its growth, for its GDP. And we believe that the US won't default. I think that, the, as always, the decision is going to be the last minute. And now we have started to see some signs of easing off from the GOP members where they are ready to give some concession to the Biden administration. All right, let's talk about Evergrande. It seems like it's selling parts of its business to try and shore up its finances. But with debts running into, what, 300 billion, can it pull it off? I think, first of all, it is essential for me to mention that it is a very healthy sign that PBOC isn't really interfering, the Chinese government isn't really interfering. It is letting 
price fine its own value given what the debt levels are with respect to the company. But at the same time, it is essential for the government and for the CBOC and other authorities to support and not let this one turn into a domino effect. Because imagine the smaller businesses, the medium-sized businesses are associated and the impact of this particular event on them. We have already started to see a uh, squeeze on the smaller to medium-sized businesses because of what is taking place with Evergrande. All right, Naeem Aslam from London there. It's good talking to you. Pleasure. And that's our show for this week. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has entire episodes for you to catch up on. I'm Sami Zaydan from the Counting the Cost team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.